Uh, thank you all for uh, coming to this session about dependency management. Um, my name is Georgios Gusius. Uh, I'm a system professor at the Delft University of Technology uh, in the Netherlands. You can find me on the internet using this uh, tag here on Twitter, GitHub, or any other social media of your choice. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, basically a project that we are currently running and that what it tries to do effectively is to scale static analysis uh, at the ecosystem level for, uh, for programming languages. We're in a room about dependency management, so I don't need to explain a lot what dependency management, management is. Uh, so, well, we, have, we can, um, basically on any programming language, we can have a dependency to a package, and this package can, can have uh, its own dependencies. And, uh, you know, dependency to dependency to dependency, if you're a computer science, scientist, you or immediately understand that this forms a graph. And the graph uh, has certain properties. Um, for example, it is version. So every time that there is a new uh, version of the package, we have a new version of the graph. The graphs are pretty big for common languages. For example, for Maven, it currently has around, uh, the Maven repository has around uh, 3.5 million artifacts. And an artifact in Maven is a package plus a version. So just in terms of uh, nodes, it's pretty big. And also, the number of connections can be uh, pretty big as well. Um, what we have been seeing lately is that the gra such graphs are also very fragile. One thing that basically triggered much of the research community, at least, to do research into uh, ecosystem uh, happened in 2016 uh, when somebody removed something from uh, NPM, a very small package, just 11 lines of code. And you know, in response, the whole uh, internet died, basically. So it was uh, very, very uh, central into the NPM, um, let's say, dependency graph. Uh, so the whole, um, there was no resolution that could work uh, for uh, many hours. And you know, there was quite a bit of tr uh, trouble there. Um, the Aquifax incident is also related to dependency management. More recent uh, cases of failures, the event stream incident where somebody injected a uh, code to steal Bitcoin uh, from uh, user wallets. Uh, REST client that happened like uh, two, three months ago, if I remember correctly. Again, it was, um, it is a REST API client for Ruby and somebody ejected code uh, to uh, get login information and post it to another uh, URL and so on. The list goes on every week. There is a new failure uh, that we need to account for. Uh, people have been doing research on that front. Um, there have been quite a bit of interest uh, lately. Uh, Tom will be uh, surely uh, presenting a lot of his uh, own work on that front. Uh, but I have some numbers here. So we have done some work in 2017, just before the uh, left pad incident happened. And we started looking into the dependency graphs. And we found that the average JavaScript project had uh, 54 dependencies. Some people replicated our work this year. This grew up to 80. And I heard, uh, I think it was Jeff today, uh, that raised this number to more than 100. So the average project on GitHub, or the average package actually on NPM, has around 100 dependencies. And this is growing very, very fast. Another thing that happens is that you know, those ecosystems uh, change in a very high rate. So we have done, uh, in our own research, we found that from the transitive dependency closure, so all the dependencies that we get by doing a package resolution, let's say, 50% uh, of those change over the course of six months. Why? Because new package versions um, are released. So we, um, you know, the, our transit dependency closure, even, even though we don't change our client, the code that we include in our client will change. Okay, so it is very important to have an understanding of what's going on in the periphery of our dependencies, not just in our immediate, immediate dependencies. We also found that um, now there exist packages in ecosystems like RubyGems, for example, that if we just remove them, and I can tell you which those are and which versions, around 40% of the ecosystem will collapse. So we'll have another uh, left pad incident. Another dark side of dependency maintenance is that uh, very few packages, sorry, a, lo a large number of core packages is maintained by very few people. So what we, um, this res those researchers, uh, Zimmerman and Tolle, have found is that uh, just 400 people maintain basically the 10 
uh, most 10,000 most important, more central packages in the Node ecosystem, in the NPM ecosystem. Now, from the consumer side, from the developer side, um, it is very difficult. Developers complain that it's very difficult to assess basically the impact of an update. So it is, uh, there has been research there because there is no tooling. So you can basically update, but you don't know what your code you're going to bring in first. And you don't know what the impact of this code, of this update will be uh, in your own code. Okay. Um, so what we, um, Raul Kula found in his research is that 85% of the dependencies in Maven are outdated and 50% in 50% of the most important packages, so the top packages in terms of uh, incoming connections. Even more alarmingly, 70% of the uh, dependencies have some kind of linking to a dependency that has a security issue. Why is that? Developers said um, that they were unaware, basically, of the security, those security problems. And as a result, there's basically vulnerabilities that proliferate in ecosystems. So um, there was a technical report by Comcast in 2017 that showed that one fourth of all library downloads actually include a vulnerability by in the transitive closure, not necessarily in the library itself. And one third of the top uh, case, uh, 100K sites have a vulnerable dependency. They include a vulnerable dependency in their uh, JavaScript code base. I, I'm pretty sure that those numbers are a bit uh, alarming. So if we aggregate uh, all the, uh, what researchers basically have found uh, the last two, three years that this uh, has been very active, we can see, we can cut, find a top, let's say, um, four basic problems. There is the observability problem. We don't know whether a new dependency um, was released and what is the impact of this dependency. And this is also encoded into the update problem. So if I update, what will break? The compliance problem, there was a, a whole uh, discussion in the morning about that. How do I know that I'm not violating anyone's copyrights? Or in any case, how I know what uh, distribute code that is compatible with uh, the licenses, uh, the license obligations that I have. And there's also the trust problem. I have all the data, I have my precious data. How can I trust my precious data to code that somebody else has written on the internet? Somebody else might be a company, but you know this doesn't actually give any uh, assurance there. There is no assurance. Now on the maintainer side, if you maintain a library, we have again uh, the, the uh, let's say the maintenance problem. So if I update, let's say uh, a function signature or a function, how many clients will I break? And as a result, because we cannot answer this question, uh, what happens is that people keep stuffing uh, stuff into the dependencies. So the dependencies grow bigger, and the code bases be you know, become uh, really big. There is also the lack of incentive problem. This is a meta problem, I would say. Um, how can we ensure that maintainers that do such an important job are basically adequately funded by the clients, by their clients, even though those clients are not explicit, there is no contract, uh, in big companies. So why should an open source developer you know, respond to issues that is coming from, you know, uh, from big companies that are not contributing to the development? The state of the art in dependency management, well, uh, what people do is that they either lock their dependencies so they don't pull in updates, this might be good, but you know it also uh, helps in well uh, not um, being able to update against uh, security patches. Uh, another thing that emerged lately, the last couple of years, is that uh, we have dependency checkers, uh, bots on GitHub especially, uh, where that read, let's say, the package uh, descriptors, and know. Uh, that there is a new update in a specific library that is included in the package uh, descriptor, and then they propose either a pull request or they, in case of GitHub, they uh, have a message in the, um, well, in the repository. But this is not necessarily uh, a panacea because, well, uh, the analysis level is very high level. 
just because we include something in our transitive dependency set doesn't mean that we actually use the code, right? So there are lots of false positives. And beyond that, uh, there is not a lot uh, beyond package version management. We don't help the maintainers to uh, maintain those dependencies. There is no support in making decisions on which libraries to include uh, in our uh, dependency set. And uh, there is no also no support in assessing updates. This is the state of dependency management as at least is being encoded by uh, researchers uh, the last two, three years. Well, we believe that we can do better than that. And to get to the root cause of the problem, uh, what we see is that while most dependency management is being done at the package level and the analysis is being done at the package level, the actual use of the dependency happens in the code. So this might look like a dependency tree or dependency linear dependency <coughs> uh, here in that case. But the actual dependency, usage of the dependencies, might indicate, for example, that this part of the code is not used at all. So if there is a security bug here, we might want to update, but it's not necessarily important. OK. The, we believe that this is the root cause, that the analysis that we are doing currently is very high level. So what we propose is instead of uh, doing analysis at the package level, to do that at the call graph level. What is a call graph? A call graph is a graph, as the name says, that links function calls uh, across the project. OK, this is as simple as that. Of course, it's a bit complicated to do static analysis in all programming languages in order to uh, get call graphs. But we are working towards uh, building tools that will allow us to do that. So if we have such a call-based dependency network in our, uh, as we propose, we can solve uh, quite a few problems in one go. Perhaps not all the problems. We cannot solve the trust problem, for example, because this is a larger and meta problem, I would say. But many of the problems that we are currently facing in dependency management, we can do something about those, at least. One of them uh, is, for example, does this vulnerability affect my code? Because we can have a direct path from a vulnerability in a function down to our code. So if we find a path in the call graph, this means that we are affected and we should update. We can do a more precise impact analysis to help the maintainers. So we can say, for example, uh, well, if I change the, if I add, a, um, if I remove a function uh, argument from a function call, how many clients will I break before I release the my update, and you know the clients actually see what that I have broken them. So if I break lots of clients, perhaps I might make the decision uh, to not release this update. Perhaps do a function overload. Okay. So what we are effectively trying to do is to um, augment the soundness. By soundness in static analysis, we mean basically the ground truth with more precision. So make the ground the actual reuse, no, not the actual reuse, the analysis of the reuse, more precise by, have, by changing uh, the unit of analysis. We have done this uh, an initial prototype and which we presented last year at FOSDEM. Um, we have uh, made, basically built call graphs for 70% of all the cargo packages. Cargo is uh, the package manager for us. It was a very precise um, you know, attempt to uh, construct this uh, huge call graphs, but the problem was, in our case, was that the uh, call graph generator in Rust was very in a bad shape back then. We're working on it currently, but uh, it still um, it didn't allow us to show the full potential of the approach. But still, it was a very promising prototype, and we, you know, based on the ideas that we have, we designed and you know got acquir acquired some funding for the Fasten project, which is like a big, a big European project with uh, seven partners across Europe that we. Uh, that aims basically to implement the Prezi um, technology or idea in that case uh, for Java, C, Python, and Rust. And on top of the 
actual core graphs, we uh, can do uh, various analysis that will be offered as part of a package manager. Um, and those analysis can be, uh, can I safely update, for example, um, you know, security vulnerability propagation and so on. So let's see how this whole thing works. And I can tell you where we are and where we're heading to. Um, so we get um, updates uh, from all those repositories, the four repositories that we support, Java, Debian, PyP, and Cargo, in a streaming fashion. So we have uh, streams of, uh, of new package uh, releases. We have a call graph generator. Uh, those are uh, basically per language. For Java, there are quite a few that are already there that are high quality. For Python, for example, we're developing our own because there is no tooling. For us, we're also developing our own. Um, for Debian, we're using uh, existing tools. This gets into two uh, databases. Um, the metadata database, which is basically based on Postgres, will be based on Postgres, actually, because it's not fully implemented yet. And we are also building an in-memory uh, high-performance uh, graph index that will allow uh, fast reachability queries on top of huge graphs. If you take Maven, uh, for example, we're expecting, uh, because it has already millions of uh, packages, package releases, we're expecting billions of nodes and perhaps uh, hundreds of billions of edges. So it's very important to have a custom query layer to do propagation uh, analysis. Then we have though this metadata database, uh, we augment with data uh, that's coming from uh, sources that are part of the community. One of them is clearly defined. We're going to have a talk about that afterwards. Another one is uh, from GHSorin, which is a tool that collects all data from GitHub, and we do some analysis on top of that. And we also try to collect vulnerability information from open sources. Sneak is not currently an open source, but for some reason I have the logo here. Um, so, but the other ones are open. Um, so we, will, we are trying to collect this and basically annotate uh, the appropriate location, either a function or a file or a package with information from all those um, sources. Another thing that we are trying to do is to uh, try to come up with a bill of materials, uh, which was a very uh, hot uh, well, topic today, at least in the meeting rooms that I was. And um, basically get information about that and annotate our metadata. And this we do uh, by building the actual packages. And on top of our two databases, we have a, a custom query layer that allows to combine data between the two. For example, if you want to get a call graph uh, for you know, five dependencies, you can give it a dependency tree, and it will try get individual call graphs for all the packages and stitch them together uh, in order to come up with a global call graph. The analysis sit on top, of course, the query language. And there is a REST API that will allow the package managers basically to get information uh, from all those sources. So the streaming sources, which is basically uh, updated as new packages come in, uh, will be available also uh, to the public. Uh, you can take a look at the code feeder project um, relatively soon, hopefully in a couple of months. Now, the uh, question that arises is how we identify a function uniquely. So what is a node in our project? In our project, is basically a function. So how we identify a function uniquely across everything? We designed a custom protocol uh, to support that. We have a grammar to validate, of course, those URLs and so on. The core technology that you are using, we call it call graph stitching. Uh, what happens is that um, what we want to do is to only uh, build a call graph uh, per package version. So usually call graph generators, what they do is that they build the whole project first, and then they try to um, explore it, to come up with nodes and um, you know, draw edges between the nodes. And if you scale that up to the Maven scale, for example, what you will be doing is analyzing the same thing over and over and over again, because there are lots of uh, packages that are reused, log4j, for example, SLF4j, projects like that. All right, so what we do is that instead of doing that, we an analyze all packages per package, at the package, package version level, sorry, we create a call graph for that, we annotate the extension points, and then we load them and link them together. Okay, that's on request. And we call this process call graph stitching. This is how our call graphs look like, so we have designed the format 
uh, to basically exchange core graphs, get the information from the core graph generator and put it into uh, our metadata database. But this is part of the open data that we'll be releasing uh, relatively soon. So it records information about the class hierarchy, uh, the graph itself, which is basically um, you know, an adjacency list, and information about the products that we're analyzing. Now, how can we use this? One uh, particular pain problem that I have described is basically how we do dependency updates. So the prototype that I will be uh, showing here is uh, not based on Fasten currently, uh, but it will be based on Fasten in its immediate release, uh, next version. So what people usually do in order to do dependency updates is that they use Dependabot. This is the default tool on GitHub. It was actually acquired by GitHub a couple of months ago. Pretty successful, two million pull requests and so on. What Dependabot and similar tools uh, do in order to ensure updates is that they run the tests. And they have some, well, in the description of all those bots is that you run uh, your test suites and this assures you that, well, the dependency update will be successful. Who thinks that this is a good strategy? Only one hand, okay. What do you think, why is it not a good strategy? Sorry? It's not testing transitive. It's not testing transitive dependencies. Is it testing direct dependencies? Are we testing direct dependencies? What do we think? No. Oh, we don't have to think a lot. Also in the interest of time, we have done this uh, for around 500 projects. Um, what we did is that we measured function coverage. And by function coverage, we mean uh, whether there, if there is a function that links into a call to a dependency, does this line get executed while we're running tests? So we instrumented the JVM while the tests were running and we tried to find from all the dependency uh, calls, from all the calls basically, uh, how many of those are executed uh, during uh, a test run. In the case of direct dependencies, actually it was not that bad to our surprise. It was around 60% of direct dependency calls are being executed by tests. But if you factor in transitive dependencies, it's like only 20%. So of the, all the paths basically that lead into transitive dependencies, only 20% are basically being executed. Not a great scenario. Okay, because most of the updates will happen, statistically will happen in the transitive set, not in your direct dependency set. All right. So what we do, um, is that we take two dependency versions, we do a source level AST diff uh, using a tool from Spoon, yes. Uh, what Spoon allows us to do is to come up with a list of uh, precise changes at the function level. So um, what we get is information like this uh, if statement uh, changed the condition from X to Z, something like that. So we get a very detailed list of uh, changes. Then we build the call graphs, and then we try to see whether from the functions that we have uh, into the updated dependency set, there is a direct path uh, back to the develop, back to the project that we're analyzing. Okay, this is basically some um, easy form of reachability analysis. <coughs> In order to test this idea, um, we took some pull requests on, uh, from Dependabot, very fresh ones. We, we have a project called GHTorrent that collects data live from GitHub, so we mine very recent pull requests from Dependabot. And you know, what Dependabot tells you is that there is uh, this version here that updated from this, you know, you only did the minor, it's not even a minor, it's a, you know, a patch version that changed, right? So theoretically you wouldn't expect a ton of changes. This is, the comment that we actually inserted into the dependable pull request, what we can see here is that, yes, it is a, indeed a, a patch version that changed, but we found that uh, 773 functions actually changed, or 84 of which are actually affecting our own code. Okay. And what we do is that we have um, information about the paths that were um, affected, and also, um, basically, the, the paths and the functions that, a, a sample of functions that um, allows us to 
um, allows the developer basically to see uh, what the problem, um, where the problem in their code is. And you know, we have also done some um, a bit more research. Um, we try to evaluate, let's say, whether uh, error, which is the name of the tool that we have developed, actually detects the changes. In terms of tests, it, it was around 40%, so we introduced artificial changes in uh, the transitive dependency set. In the case of tests, it was around 40%, the detection rate. In the case of data, it was around 90-something uh, percent. So it's way more precise. This part here is uh, basically represents reflection. So if you do reflection, we are lost. OK, <laughs> that's simple as that. Anyway, my time is up. So I wanted to show you some how you know, the fasting would look like in terms of developer workflow. Think about this uh, update scenario that I presented. Uh, being integrated into PIP. Yeah, now uh, let's uh, let's end it there just to give it. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to know more information about the project, it's here. Um, we are running also a survey about dependency management. If you want to help us, um, this is the URL over there. So, and we are will be around uh, for questions and so on. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Are you actually doing binary analysis on Debian now, or no? Not yet. We are we are doing call graphs for for Debian binaries. Yes, using Syscout and uh, SVF. Okay. So one of the examples you had mentioned was that you could use the call graph level dependency graph as a false positive reducer for uh, impact analysis for. Yep, yep. Did you also do that when you were analyzing whether or not the downstream packages were testing their dependencies? In no, terms of no, no, but it, it, that's a very good suggestion. Basically, that actually we submitted this specific paper like a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yesterday, when I was putting the slides together, it, you know, it, it just crossed my mind. So and, and we didn't do it. Change the, the result. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, we could add this information in the report that we in the comment that we do in the dependable pull request, and it would be very helpful, actually. Uh, what about, yeah. is, is there a thesis where you have breaking changes that are not actually based on call graph, uh, but on other uh, uh, we, specific we, we, we don't do that, because we expect the compiler to be able to do that in compiled languages. Um, so if you compile with a new version, you know, there is an API that breaks, the compiler will tell you. But you know, that's valuable for languages that don't have a compiler. But we don't do that currently. So you only focus on compiling? Yes, at the moment, yes. Yes. Uh, the, usually, the, what you do with static analysis is that you tend to over-approximate, which will generate some false positives. But for use cases like security, for example, it's better to have false positives than you know, false negatives, because it gives a wrong impression to the developers. So the direct answer to your question is that we don't have any features. We basically let it explode. The biggest challenge is that call graph generation is not a solved problem. It's actually an unsolvable problem, to be precise, <laughs> because you can never you can never be 100% uh, um, sound uh, by definition. Uh, so the better the tooling, the more assurance uh, we can give to the developers. So languages like Java, for example, the call graph status there is pretty good. Languages like Python that are com or JavaScript that even worse, basically, that are completely dynamic. There is so much that we can do with static analysis. Okay. Uh, one last question. Do uh, uh, you have plans to support a reflection? Because at the end, when you have reflection, you're going to have thousands of uh, false negatives. So. Yes, one, one plan we have is to, um, because we're doing, doing that at the massive scale, 
uh, to actually run the tests uh, in all the projects. And in many cases, the tests allow you to allow projects to execute reflection paths, paths that are affected by reflection. So we will take those edges, basically, and put them into our core graph. So our core graph will be richer by running the tests across all projects. And we also plan to actually crowdsource the test running, so uh, allow people that have the uh, use our tooling, basically, to upload part of the core graph that is not you know, in their own code base uh, back to our uh, database. Th that, there's so much we can do with reflection as well. Um, there have been people that are doing that in um, Java with uh, tool toolkits like Doop, but it is not extremely scalable. And also, it relies on heuristics. Okay, thank you. Yeah.